joining us again here on Rebel Voices in Education, a diversity and inclusion webcast. Each week we'll bring you a panel of brilliant guests who offer their insights and experience in diversity and inclusion in education and answer your questions. I'm Hannah Jepson, a business psychologist and co-founder of LGBT Ed. And today, um, before we start, just to let you know that the terminology that we use in today's webcast is the terminology that we've agreed uh, with, the, with our guests today. Thank you, Hannah. And I'm Amy Ferguson, teacher of performing arts and deputy head teacher. Our guests today are Storm and Evie. Welcome, both of you, first of all. Hello. Hello. Um, Hello. For those who haven't met you before, can you tell us just a little bit about yourself and your teaching experience? Evie, we'll start with you. Uh, I'm a primary school teacher. I'm currently a year six teacher and I lead um, reading and writing literature at the school. Uh, but I've been teaching for 14 years, I think now, uh, and I've taught all the way through key stage two. Uh, I am a newly qualified teacher, uh, officially of English, but in secondary sectors, and but currently I am due to start a contract as a drama teacher, and I'm a wheelchair user. Yeah, really nice to have you here. Um, so we start every episode by asking our panel our Rebel Voices questions. So um, as teachers with disabilities, um, what has been your experience of diversity and inclusion in schools? And if we can start with Storm. It's been a whole journey to you know, get to where I am right now. Um, I was very lucky in when I trained as a teacher, I, had an, uh, I was at the Institute of Education and I had an amazing, amazing tutor who was totally on board and it's about uh, I think for me, it's been a mixture of finding the allies that you need and also um, facing some real, real struggles and being able to fight. It's mainly imposter syndrome, I think. I think when you are in a minority, especially if you're a teacher, there is feels like there's already so many things against you and you already have so much more to prove than other teachers. Certainly when I was training, I felt like I was constantly on the back foot. And um, so my experiences have been a mixed bag. I've had some pretty good mentors. I had two very, very different placements. One was, you know, in very, very different schools. One was one in a particular way that didn't really sue me. And then one I found a really good mentor and had a much better and positive experience. I think diversity and inclusion is everyone's responsibility. It isn't just about um, the teachers, it's it's about the children as well. And you'd be surprised the amount of um, negative, negative attitudes towards other, from other teachers, from staff members. So what, I think what you really need to know when you are a teacher, with a disability is that people are on your side and they want you to succeed and they want you to do well and they're willing to adapt and change things in the way that you um, need them to be done. To pick up on, you talked about that kind of imposter syndrome and how, how did you kind of, how are you still kind of working through that? Because, you know, we, we, we lots of us face it anyway. And then if you're part of a minoritized group, then, you know, it, it potentially is even more, um, we experience it even more. So how have you, what are the things that you've done to kind of support yourself through feeling that? Oh, it's like, it's a massive process and you still feel it every day. Like it's not something that, and but I think really it's about making sure that, that you affirm yourself, you know, you say, because you got a job because people want you, because you're a good teacher. So people, have clearly seen that you're able to do this job and it's about having kind of the self-belief and the motivation to think no actually I do belong in this situation and diversity is inclusion is about having everyone at the table so I think just things like positive affirmations like all the mindfulness stuff that they teach us you know when training to be a teacher especially a drama teacher all of that really helps and realizing that sometimes 
it isn't always about you. Sometimes it's about another person's projecting how they feel onto you and then therefore that makes you feel a certain type of way. And I think, but yeah, and also finding really, really good allies. You know, I found two or three amazing people while I was training to be a teacher. But one of them was a friend, one of them was a mentor, one of them was my university tutor. And as long as you have a few people, it doesn't have to be everyone, but a few people that understand your magic and what you want to bring, then it makes the journey a lot easier. Thank you so much. Evie, over to you. Uh, my experience has been different over the years because so I've been a teacher for, I don't know whether it's 13 years or 14 years. I was trying to count. I couldn't work it out. Um, but when I came into teaching, my hearing loss wasn't that great. So I, I call myself deaf. But strangely enough, when I introduce myself, I use the sign for hearing impaired because my hearing has gotten worse over time. So I was born hearing, then went deaf, had my hearing corrected and then or fixed, whatever, however you want to term it. And then it's um deteriorating over time so when I first came into the profession I could I didn't wear hearing aids I just lip read all the time and over the last kind of 10 years or so my hearing has deteriorated to the point where I now wear two very good and they're very well hidden but I wear here two hearing aids um and it does I work in a mainstream school but it does affect everything I do I lip read all day every day it makes me really tired and that kind of it, it, it's around me all the time so from where I was when I first started teaching to where I am now my experience has kind of changed over time whereas when I started teaching I didn't really need to mention it and I just kind of it was my thing I dealt with it and I put things in place to help myself now I'm at the point where I have to tell people because I need their help now but where I work everyone's so lovely I've been here for six years and my uh, HR knows the head knows and they make allowances and they allowances is the wrong word they put things in place so that people don't tend to notice my disability it's just part of how my classroom runs it's part of how I work you know I sit at the back in staff meetings so I can see the front and but everyone just knows and it just is and it's become part of um, the culture here you know I'm not the only one with a hearing loss and I'm not I have children in my classes who have hearing loss so therefore it's become part of the culture in the school that those things those um, procedures that we put in place for me and for those children are there all the time and it goes kind of unnoticed now which I really like somebody else another person with hearing loss might not like it might like it to be more uh, pronounced and mm, I don't know made a bigger deal of but I like that those things are now seamless now and it just it just is everyone is on board and everybody understands Evie needs this Evie needs that we'll turn the lights on so Evie can see this and it, it's not it's not talked about anymore everyone is just inclusive it's a really lovely place to work this and it's I'm actually here right now actually and looking at all the things that are in place around my room to help me and it's it is seamless now and it's been it's been a journey getting here but um, I'm definitely very grateful for all the things that are in place now. On that point, um, does that make you feel um, kind of nervous about moving on? Like if you ever wanted to move on, does that kind of, given your, you feel so safe and valued um, in that space, like how does that, thinking about another career choice or a, a progression, like how would that make you feel? Absolutely. So I'm at the point in my career now where um, I'm halfway through my MPQSL. I lead a core subject across the school. Um, with another colleague um, but we're a big school it's a big deal I've taken on a lot of curriculum responsibility I am at the point in my career where I could jump ship if I wanted to to progress up the ladder but that does that fear of right everything here is right and everybody here knows and everybody understands and it's expected it's not expected but those things are just there the idea of going somewhere else and a, starting afresh and having to do all that, oh, but I'm deaf so I won't be able to access that or um, is there any chance you can do this so that I can see that or that I can lip read and things like that. Um, that terrifies me. It, it really does. Having to, uh, it's like coming out all over again. And I did that when I was 18. I don't want to do that again. I That's, that's hard. But the other thing that scares me is not getting a job because of it. 
go in for an interview. I know I'm a, a good teacher, or at least I like to think I am. I, I wouldn't want my disability, my hearing loss to be the reason, I, not that anyone would ever be able to say that that was the reason they didn't give me the job, but I wouldn't like, oh, she's deaf, that's going to be more difficult for us to integrate her into the staff. I wouldn't want that to be a reason that anyone denied me a job because I know I'm a good teacher. And if you if you help me put the right things in place, you won't even notice that I'm deaf. Does that answer my question? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so when we're thinking about diversity and inclusion in schools, there are things um, that work and there are things that don't work. And in the schools that you have worked in or that you've experienced or you've heard about, what does um, outstanding diversity and inclusion in schools look like? Uh, we'll start with um, Storm, please. I think outstanding diversity and inclusion looks like seeing people as individuals. Um, it's being willing and able to do things in a, in a slightly different way um, and not seeing that as a disadvantage, but rather as an advantage. I mean, I, I totally related to what Evie was saying because I'm just at the start of this for me. I've no, and I've been trying to find any other teachers in London that have um, any ambulatory dis like disabilities, I've, you know, just so I can ask somebody else, you know, how do you deal with X, Y, Z, what kind of, and I really get the whole thing of not wanting to leave a safe, a safe situation. In terms of, uh, sorry, I really went off on a massive tangent and um, outstanding what works. I think, yeah, being able to see people as individuals Definitely finding the one of the biggest things is having the faith to say, do you know what? We want you to be here and we want to find a way to make this better for you. Um, and even when you don't know the answers, being able to go out and find them, by like asking someone else who might have the answer and having an open conversation about needs, about respectable, how to make spaces better, um what doesn't work i think a culture of fear is a really really toxic thing i think it ebbs into the kids and then it ebbs into the staff as well because i think if people are going into an ultimately situation training as a teacher is hard enough training as a teacher when you have a disability and you know that people may already be holding a certain preconceived judgment about you means you need someone to go do you know what we really want you to do this so we're going to find a way and i think yeah a culture of fear is really really harmful but the willingness the space and the time to see people as individuals can create an outstanding result evie what do you think for me it's having the space to have those conversations so either going out out of your comfort zone and explaining what you need or the people you work with there being a culture whereby they can just come and ask not making assumptions to make assumptions is the in my opinion is the worst thing you can do to hear for me because i i don't sound deaf i speak really clearly because i was born hearing i People don't assume that I'm deaf until people see my hearing aids or I take them out and then I do slur slightly. Or if I actually say something, then they think to ask. But it's almost that knife edge of people are scared to ask for fear of offending. It's To me, it's much less offensive to just ask the question in the first place. What do you need? What can we help you with? And that, to me, is inclusion to ask somebody what can we do to help you access this or what do we need to do to level the playground you know so that everything is um open and and there is that honest dialogue that's what inclusion looks like to me in terms of um what diversity looks like i think that's having people on staff that look and have those differences so that our children see that the world is diverse that there are different types of people in the world you know having we're a fairly big staff we're a, a three form entry primary school so it's three teachers at least in every year group we're quite a big school we have a large amount of TAs we are a big staff we have enough staff here to be able to represent the full kind of 
spectrum of humanity, which is really lovely. And it means that our kids see um, gay teachers, deaf teachers, BAME teachers, they see everything, this entire spectrum. And that helps them see what they could be in their future. You know, they see themselves reflected in some member of staff somewhere in the building. And I think that creates this inclusive atmosphere, this diverse atmosphere where everybody is accepted, regardless of who you are, where you're from, how long you've been in the country, whatever disability or your skin colour. I think that just reflected and having that open dialogue for everything just builds a culture of diversity and inclusion. I do think that is so important. We, we do speak about um, this a lot, about the fact that the, the teaching staff, the support staff, the um, anyone who's working in the school needs to be you know, representative of that kind of student body as well, doesn't it? So that people feel included, people see themselves. Because if you don't, you, you feel invisible and you grow up with that kind of hanging over you, that you are invisible. Han? Yeah, absolutely, totally agree. And and, I, and also, like, I think um, there's a real danger sometimes for people to assume that schools are this, like, bubble um, that exists kind of separate to the rest of society and actually they're a, they should be a real reflection so that when you send young people out of your school, they aren't surprised by how diverse the world is. Um, so I think that they're, they're all really good points. Um, and I think to your both of your points before, it's about kind of... Um, creating safe spaces where you can have potentially uncomfortable conversations because some of them are going to be uncomfortable but knowing it's a safe space to ask how do you like to be referred to like how do, what's the best way to, to talk about this you know that they're the ways that you can then kind of yeah help you to feel safe and valued but also help people to ask the questions that they they might not have ever come across before um and i guess to that point really um the next next question is around um, not everyone is on board with this stuff instantly. Um, it's not. It's not. It's not like um, it, it's a journey, isn't it, for everybody? Um, and everyone's got varying levels of comfortability with some of this stuff in terms of DNI. So I guess um, I guess for us, we're just interested in thinking about your perspectives on how do you change hearts and minds when it comes to some of this stuff. So what what are the things that you use to change people's um, yeah views or, or or kind of stagnating opinions on some of this stuff and um, and I'll go to Storm first if that's okay okay um I mean like I feel like there's two points to be made here. like like you should always do your best to do your job to be as excellent as you possibly can and we all know that because we're all education professionals but at the same time you shouldn't exhaust yourself trying to prove yourself to someone or to prove yourself with your worth and your value in the situation. Obviously, do your best, put your best foot forward in every situation that you're in, um, especially if you, if you feel insecure about it. Do your best, put your best foot forward. But do it at the death, do it only to a level that you're comfortable and do it to a place where you feel like because you sh you shouldn't have to be in a situation where you are overstepping your own like where you are sacrificing your own mental but overstepping your own mental boundaries to try and prove oh no no I do belong in this room I definitely do belong in this room and I think yeah like it is it is you know there are things that are complicated and there are things there are nuances there are difficult conversations that go across all parts of society but we have a responsibility as teachers to challenge those but also you know I, I don't know I feel like changing people's minds is as long as you're excellent at what you what you do I'm going to take it like for example a parent who might you know have a have a particular view about you as a teacher all you can do is prove that you are there for a reason and but don't go out of your don't go out of your way because you shouldn't have to completely break yourself down just to be just to be allowed in a certain space i mean like and i think but also yeah having open conversations is another thing asking the uncomfortable question what exactly is it that you have 
an issue with like what is there anything we can do to make this conversation easier for you i mean it might make you both feel a little bit weird but it's important to have it and then maybe you'll make progress but at the same time don't exhaust yourself and exhaust your brain and don't let them sort of get you down in a in a real impactful way because you shouldn't have to constantly prove your existence and your worth because it's just it gets tiring yeah thank you storm evie um i guess i don't really go out of my way like storm said i i i am this but being deaf isn't first and foremost me you know i come to work to teach and it's not my hearing loss isn't the, the be all and end all of me i you know i love to read that's the be all and end all of me i'm the crazy book lady that's that's who i am at school but in terms of my i don't go out of my way to kind of educate people i guess but at the same time i when i teach if i'm tired i sign at the same time so i use sign supported english because bsl comes to me before english words do so sometimes i find it easier to find the sign before i find the english word so my classroom is full of sign language and my kids will learn to sign and then that goes out into um other classes and other kids and they pick it up as well and then before you know it, we're having conversations about different types of language well, I speak this and you speak that and then that leads to a bigger conversation about inclusion etc but I don't I don't go out of my way to change people's hearts and minds I guess maybe I should maybe I should be more of a uh, a voice but I first and foremost I come to school to teach and I, I come to school to change the hearts and minds of my children and change their outlook on life and what they can achieve if through doing that we then talk about disability and different forms of disability then so be it um the only time i would go out of my way is if for example i did move school i did go somewhere new or if i go to a conference or something like that there are things that i need i need to be able to access the microphone and things like that so that it plays into my hearing aid but i don't i, I guess i don't i don't go out of my way to this is who i am and deafness is just a part of that I don't I don't go out of my way to, to make a big deal of it or at least I try not to because I try to make my disability seem just normal you know this is who I am and we're all different this is just one more thing that makes me different I guess we ask that question because I think sometimes um in organizations in schools like it it sometimes is um the risk like seem to be the responsibility of that person who is yeah. in that minority group to kind of educate, raise awareness, advocate, all of those things. But actually um, to kind of your point and to Storm's point earlier, like diversity and inclusion is everybody's responsibility. And um, yeah, it, you know, actually um, sometimes check, like getting people to move along the journey with you is just about being yourself and showing them that you are there in the same way that everybody else is, i.e. to teach those young people. Um, so yeah, that, that that really makes sense. Thank you both. Um, Amy, over to you. Thank you. So the second part of the webcast, we ask our guests to answer questions or dilemmas related to diversity and inclusion in education. Our first question has been sent via email and says, hello Rebels. I have a disability that affects my speech and I've been teaching for seven years. I want to progress my career and I feel like I'm ready to apply for more senior roles, but I'm worried that because of my speech that I will face some discrimination. This makes me nervous. What should I do? If you want to, if you've got any ideas, give us a wave. There you go. Thanks, Evie. So that comes back to what I was saying earlier about me wanting to move up the ladder. And I think that, uh, I think it comes down to, just do it. So there are things that I need in order to access um, even conversations with, with another person, but that doesn't stop me being really good at my job. And if I wanted to, I haven't, I've only been literacy leading my school for a couple of years. Prior to that, I, I had thought about applying, but didn't because there was always that fear of, uh, I won't get it or it'll be denied me because of the things that hold me back, I guess. But um, 
um, 10% braver, just being 10% braver, put yourself out there, do it anyway. The worst they can say is no. And actually in the teaching profession, you get knocked back so often that you get quite good at picking yourself back up again and starting afresh. So it would just be one more knock back, but you'll get there eventually. So when the time comes and the, the position is there, 10% braver, just, just that little bit extra and you never know what you can get out of it. That's what got me here today being 10% braver I never would have put myself forward for anything like this years ago but you know 10% braver the worst they can say is no thank you Storm what what do you think exactly basically what Evie said I mean it's really and I understand how hard it is because for me I had to take a year out between do, do, doing my PGCE and getting my first teacher job. I wasn't successful in, uh, I think I had about 30 interviews and I've just managed to get my first year. So I totally understand when you feel beaten down and you're, especially when you already have something in your head that is telling you that you don't belong in that particular space. Um, the What I would say is that you, you, if you do face any discrimination, you have to remember that it isn't about you. It's not something to do with you. It's not because you weren't good enough. It's not because you, it's because you are, it's because the schools that you are applying for do not see the value and, and the worth of having someone like you on your staff team. In the same way, I would say, don't compromise on the school that you apply for. Make sure if you go for senior, senior, senior positions that you feel totally safe and valued and respected and you feel like the school is on your side and that they want you to be there and that they are willing to provide whatever adaptations or something is it that you need. I don't know why I'm having so much to talk about this. I'm just at the start of this process for me and, I, and I'm very much aware of that. Like I, I have so much still to learn and i have a very i have a very unique perspective on this of course but you know i do hopefully want to progress up the teaching ladder but i am just starting so it is like i do i'm aware of that as well so well just to speak on on what you've just said storm um please don't think that just because you are you know just starting out on the journey that that makes your opinion or your viewpoint whatever um any less valuable because that's certainly not the case and that's the reason you know that we asked you to come because we want to hear from lots of different people at lots of different times in in their teaching journey or wherever they are in their kind of uh, diversity and inclusion journey it's really important that people hear from you like you're saying you want to make connections with you know um lots of people and this and this is the way to do it and it's important that we are you know visible and we're out there and talking about things that we're passionate about Han yeah just absolutely uh, echo what Amy said and I think you know it's your unique perspective that we absolutely wanted to hear from today and it's you know it, you know, it's already been so valuable for me for me to listen to that. So I know that everybody else is going to find um, both of your inputs really valuable. So yeah, it, it, you know, the, the the webcast is called Rebel Voices, not Senior Voices. You know, we we want people who have got unique perspectives and and great insights in 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 kind of diversity and inclusion. So yeah, don't ever think that just because you're not uh, a senior leader yet that you, we don't value your opinion because we really do. Um, so uh, next and final questions come through uh, from email. So dear Hannah and Amy, thank you for creating this opportunity for us teachers to connect. I'm, I'm in need of some advice. Um, I have a disability which is not visible. Um, I'm scared to tell my head in case I'm viewed differently. Uh, I'd be grateful for any advice you can offer on this. Thank you. So um, yeah, I guess we've, we've kind of touched on that a little bit today already, but um, yeah, that kind of difference between visible and, and invisible disabilities. Anybody got any thoughts? Evie, you've unmuted. Uh, just because uh, kind of been there, done that. Yeah. Um, my 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 hearing loss isn't visible. You wouldn't walk into a room and instantly know I was deaf. Um, and if I'm not wearing my hearing aids, there's no way you can tell. So I've, I've been there. And when I first got my hearing aids, when my um, hearing had had really worsened, I had to go and have that conversation with my head. There was nothing I could do about it because there were things that I started to need, or um, there were situations I was finding difficult. 
Um, and that first conversation is terrifying, or it was for me. And I found myself apologising for myself and apologising for my disability, which I was still getting to grips with the idea that it was a disability and it wasn't just, you know, I just have trouble hearing. That first conversation that I found myself apologising for needing the lights on or finding that it was apologising for needing to leave my classroom door open so I can hear what's going on. And that's not what it needs to be. That that conversation that you have needs to be, this is who I am. You already know I'm a good teacher. This is just what the adaptations that I need in order to keep doing that really good job that you already know I'm doing. And it's it's hard and it took me ages to get the guts up to do it. Um, but once I started to own that um, dis- disability label and stop seeing disability as a negative thing, but just as a thing, it just is. I am unable to hear. It doesn't make me a negative. It's just there's something I can't do, I can't hear. So I went and had the discussion on that front rather than um, apologising. The first time I went, I went and apologised for everything. You know, I'm really sorry, but I'm going to need this. And I'm really sorry, is there anything more you can do to help me with that? But then went back, must have been about six months later when my hearing loss had increased and I had new hearing aids and stuff, and went and said, actually, there's there's nothing wrong. I'm still doing a really good job, but these are the things that are going to allow me to do an even better job. I'm not going to apologise for how I am. I just can't hear like everybody else can. And I want to be visible to the rest of our you know the school and the children here because we have children on in school who have disabilities want them to see that you can grow up and be um successful and do what you want to do regardless of a disability so having that first conversation was it was terrifying (laughs) I did find it really difficult but then once I'd said it and I'd start to own that label of I have a disability and I saw it as not a negative thing anymore but as a I just have an inability to do something, then it made it much easier to talk about and much easier to ask for what I needed when I stopped seeing it as a negative and stopped apologising for myself and just asked for what I needed. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely it does. Yeah. And 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 actually, um, you know, you 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 just use the words there like an inability to do something, but actually your story about actually how people who come into your class can now sign and they talk about that actually like it's reframing it isn't it right because you yes you can't hear um as well as i can but actually you have you have so many other things that actually you're bringing to that classroom that really enrich those young people's lives um in a way that you know somebody else couldn't do so it's kind of reframing it isn't it yeah yeah taking that negative spin off the word disability and but it's taken me a long time to do that and i'm not saying that everybody will ever feel that way but for me turning everything on its head and stopping stop seeing myself as a a a drain on the school and you know oh they've got to change this and this and this and more as a yeah but I bring an entirely new dimension to the school you know we've got deaf kids in the school and now they see deaf teacher you know they can go and compare hearing aids and we can talk about deaf stories and we can talk about deaf characters in tv and things like that there's a whole other realm to it now rather than just apologizing for the fact that I need to leave my door open yeah thank you thanks Evie Storm anything to add on that one do you know I just wanted to say Evie is so nice to like hear that there is another person (laughs) who has gone through like similar experiences and also that because I feel exactly the same about having the conversations about having adaptions to my classroom and to the bathrooms and to whatever I need to be a disabled wheelchair using teacher. Like, so, and I was, I got my job about a month ago and I spent the first two weeks completely like terrified about having a conversation and not knowing like where to even start and thinking, oh my God, they're going to fire me because like they're going to just think that was too complicated. Why would we bother? So it's, really really nice to see that there's another teacher who's a couple of years ahead of me like that has faced similar struggles obviously not completely but like I completely relate to how that feels and it's really nice to know that I wasn't the only one because I'm still trying to find other disabled teachers and you're actually the first one that I've met so it's really nice to know that you are there 
and that you do that we do exist so like I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity really and just sort of say that I think I suppose Thank you. Really valuable insights for, from both of you there. The last thing that we ask our guests to do is to tell us in one sentence how you're going to continue to be a rebel voice in education. So Storm, let's start with you at the start of your journey. What are you going to do? Um, I hope to prove that disability is not a barrier to success and that I hope to be the teacher that 14 year old Storm really wanted to see in the classroom and really wanted to know about. And I hope to make other young women and young men feel seen and accepted and loved for themselves. I'm going to continue to be unapologetically me and stop apologising for uh, my hearing loss and who I am. This is, you know, this is me. Stop apologising, stand up and be seen. I fit so many minority categories that I feel that my kids need to see me. I want to be, I think I finally am the the person that like 14 year old Evie needed to see. So uh, yeah, keep being unapologetically me. Thank you both so much. Um, gosh, I got getting emotional in every single one of these. Um these webcasts. Um, thank you both for, for coming on and, and taking some time out to chat to us. Um, it's been really, really um, great to talk to you both. Thank you for sharing your story so candidly. Um, just one thing to say, which um, I don't know if you, you know about them, um, Storm, because you mentioned, um, but Disability Ed um, are on Twitter. They're, they're only just kind of starting, so they're not kind of um, not as far along in their journey as, as say, LGBT Ed or Women Ed or BAMED, but they are um, a network for um, teachers with, a dis with disability, disabled teachers. Um, so if you're on Twitter, which you know you are, um, worth following them and, and connecting with them because I know that they, they've kind of got good, um, big ambitions and want to do some great work. So um, just to, to shout that out. But yeah, thank you both for, for coming. I know you've got your Twitter handles there if people want to connect with you. Um, and I'll just hand back over to Amy to uh, close us off. Thank you very much, Han, and thank you, you two. It's been brilliant listening to both of your journeys and where you are at at the moment in your kind of uh, teaching journey and your DNI journey as well. And it's been really valuable, and it's really important that we do hear from lots of different groups of people, and that's why you guys are here today. And thank you to those of you, wherever you are in the world, who's watching this right now, could be anywhere. Please like and subscribe to our channel so you can keep up to date with our webcast and tag us in on your comments on Twitter, hashtag Rebel Voices in Education. Stay tuned for information on the next on next week's guests, and we'll see you next time. Bye.